himself in a civil defense class down at Staley Hall. Now, for you young people who don't know what civil defense class is, this was in the middle of the Cold War, and we were required to take classes to tell us how to survive in the case of a Russian nuclear attack. I was in that class when the doors flung open in the back of the auditorium, someone yelled at downtown, and they turned it up. Hmm. By the time I reached the front of campus, students were flooding back on the campus. My entire involvement that night was hearing stories secondhand of how young ladies were held and beaten by policemen. How people had to become violent to keep from being injured by policemen. Wednesday morning, I attended a meeting in Whitehall, a building that does not stand where the students in South Carolina State were to give, present grievances to city officials. I cannot remember one thing that was said in that meeting except the word Negro. Mm -hmm. And when I heard that word, I took it out to everything that happened. That evening, I found myself over on Claflin's campus, where a number of students had assembled, and they were throwing bricks, other debris, at policemen who were stationed across the street. I didn't feel comfortable in that environment, so I came back over to South Carolina State and joined a group sitting in front of the dining hall. We were talking about the events of the last couple of days when I heard a car engine speeding on the campus, oh, yeah. occupied by two white men, firing weapons randomly towards the girls' dormitory. I watched the car go through campus, hit a dead end because we were building the library at the time. It used to be a thoroughfare. And they had to turn around and come back. And I, along with everyone up there, helped that car with everything that I could find. I understand the gentlemen were apprehended. But I never heard of any charges being brought against them. But that's not the day I want to focus on. Thursday, February 8th. I rose that morning and went to class. That day seemed so long, almost too long. There was an eerie feeling in the air all day long. But it was as normal a day as you would see on this camp. Early evening, I uh, did as I do many evenings. I stopped by Manning Hall to visit my now wife. I was trying to convince her that she deserved me. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting in the lobby, again, a voice comes in. It says they built a bonfire down in the middle of the street. Much to her dismay, I decided to join that group. And when I initially arrived, the bonfire really hadn't gotten going yet. And it was cold, folks. It was cold. Today. I made the decision to go back to my dormitory room, get some more clothes. So I left the front of campus, went, and by the time I returned, the bonfire was fully ablaze. People were standing around. We were talking, they were joking, they were singing. And then I noticed the fire engine at the end of the street. 
Notice the fire engine started moving towards us, and as the fire engine got closer, we retreated slowly back onto campus. And then again, there was a voice that said, let's go back down and watch him put the fire out. Slowly, we started moving back towards the front of campus. I don't know about the people in the dormitories, but if you were out on that field that night, you remember the shot. One distinct shot. And that entire embankment went from quiet to a firework show. If you've never seen the wrong side of the shotgun, I can tell you right now it makes a beautiful color blue flame. That's all we can see is blue flames all the way across the front. Instinctively, I found myself on the ground. Laying there, what could not have been, but a second or two, felt the stinging sensation in my back. There is no one in here that could have convinced me at that point in time that they were actually firing real bullets. My thought was that they were firing some riot control rubber bullets or something. And I distinctly remember the thought, get up before one of these things hits you in your head, knocks you out, and you take a weapon from these folks. As I turned to look back, the entire lawn was almost empty. There were a few people struggling to get, make their way back. As I came back into campus, I noticed the flow headed towards the infirmary. So I followed the flow of traffic, found myself on the porch of the infirmary, asking what happened. Someone said, hey, guy, you know you've got a hole in your sweater. And I'm like, yeah, they're firing that riot control stuff at me. And and all of a sudden, I found myself being accosted by seven, eight people stripped from the waist up, picked up, being carried into the infirmary. And I'm fighting until I got to a mirror that was hanging on the wall, and I saw a home. Needless to say, my entire demeanor changed. <laughs> I was put in a car, transferred, to the color emergency room. Sitting in a chair, a nurse came by. And she says, if there's anyone here who feels like they can, please come and help. We need help. I got up, followed her into a room. Arriving in that room, I saw four or five people lying on tables. She led me to this one table. A young man lying on the table, body twitching, bleeding from his mouth, bleeding from his nose. And I immediately recognized him. That gentleman was sad. Sam and I had to develop a very special bond. You see, we both arrived here on campus in August of the year before. We both joined the football team that year. We reported for training. We were both linebackers. 